shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you.
just thank him for his love tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, God. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lift your hands, give him that praise tonight. I love you tonight, God. I worship you tonight. Hallelujah. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace tonight, God. I lift my voice to you. I love you tonight, Father. I love you tonight, Jesus. Have your will and your way in our hearts. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Do you love him tonight? I'll say it again. Do you love him tonight? To God be the glory. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. We're happy tonight to have Brother Norton with us. Amen. Praise God. For those of you that may not know Brother Norton, he is responsible for building this building. Amen. Hallelujah. And I just want him to come and share his testimony with you tonight. Amen. We'll greet you. Welcome you. God bless Brother Norton. Amen. Glory. Lord's good. I pray for this church almost daily. I tell him the pastor that uh, I don't dream or think much on dreams, especially mine. But uh, the other night, just a day or two ago, before I come up here, I was sitting there just as real as it was when Brother Overton told me, he said, the Lord, give me a testimony or something. But he said, we're going to run a thousand in this church. I told him, I said, the Lord reaffirmed that to me the other night. He said, you remember that vision or everyone I told Brother Overton going around a thousand? I said, yes. He said, I hadn't forgot it. It's going to happen. One by one. I'm so glad to be here. Glad to be a part of this church. Glad to see it still going on for Jesus. And me love Pray for revival to happen in this church every day. It's going to happen. You're having revival, but just great revival. Praise the Lord. Love him. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Always a blessing to have Brother Norton with us and thank God that he's here. He got his airplane ticket a little messed up. He was trying to make it for the anniversary service and uh, booked the wrong dates and they wanted way too much money to change it. Amen. But I'm glad that he came anyway. Amen. Praise God. I'd also like to just say thank you to all of you that had a part in uh, our 25th anniversary service. As far as I'm concerned, it went out, went wonderful. Amen. I had a wonderful time. My family did. Special thanks to Sister Andrea and Sister Janelle. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, I'll include Sister Allie in that as well. She worked very, very hard. Amen. And I just want you to know that we appreciate it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We're going to receive our offering. Ask you to prepare to give. And we want to remind all the youth that there is a youth function at the Frederick Church. Amen. And uh, that's on Friday, February 28th. Amen. So uh, all those that would like to go on that youth event to Apostolic Lighthouse in Frederick, see Brother and Sister Clark, and they'll be happy to take the van and bring you with them. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. There is a prayer conference and coming up at Brother Libby's church the middle of next month. I'll give Brother Little the information on that. You'll be hearing about that probably on Sunday. Amen. 
While we stand together, we'll pray over the offering. Then you can march and come and give to the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for your blessings. And thank you for a wonderful weekend. Thank you for the love of the church. Thank you for the, every gift and every card and every kind word that was given, Lord. We just lift you up and we give you thanks. We appreciate all that you have done in our midst. And we look forward with great anticipation to what you're going to do. I ask you tonight to bless the offering, bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Amen. As they sing, come and give to the Lord. Amen. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. Power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Amen. Lift your hands and give God praise. Amen. To God be the glory. Brother Vogler is coming to minister the word. God bless him as he comes. I apologize for the PA tonight. This seems to be the only mic working. Amen. Praise God. So at least uh, you're going to be able to hear Brother Vogler. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. I did want to announce tonight that tonight is the conclusion of our study in the book of Romans. Hope that you've enjoyed it. Amen. And next Thursday night, we're going to start a new series called Follow to Lead. Amen. And it's all about making disciples. Amen. God has called us to make disciples. Amen. So uh, we will start a new series next Thursday night. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Has God been good to you? That was pretty weak. Has God been good to you? Amen. God is a good God. Amen. Sometimes we have that image of God being sitting in heaven on his throne with a grumpy face, looking down at people, wondering why and uh, you know what's going on and when are they going to mess up so that he can lower the boom on them have you ever thought about that as an image of god you ever you ever seen that as an image of god that's not the kind of god we serve the kind of god we serve is a kind of god that that loves us so much that the infinite god came down. Is this doing anything at all? Okay. 
Tell me, just give me a thumbs up when it's good so I'll start talking into it again. The infinite God came down and became finite, and he died on a cross for us. That's the kind of God I serve. I serve a God that loves. I serve a God that has, has mercy. I serve a God that wants with everything in him for me to succeed. And he's not waiting for me to fall down, and he's not waiting for me to fail. Can you hear me? Yeah, right. Can you hear yourself? Praise God. I don't need to hear myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the kind of God we serve. We serve the God that wants us to succeed. But the only way we can succeed is in him. Any other way, we are like a thief trying to get into heaven, and it won't work. We have to do it his way. It has to be in him. Amen? Amen. God is good all the time. We're going to, we're going to look at the last chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 16. And if you've read Romans chapter 16, you know it has all those names in it. Paul greets this person and that person and all those, uh, all those Roman names that are complicated and I can't pronounce. So I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to teach on some of the verses, and we're not going to go through the whole thing. All right? So bear with me. But we will start with Romans chapter 1, and uh, Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, which says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a, cert- a servant of the church, which is at Corinthia. Or something like that. And before I get started, I do want to pray. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to come before you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that your desire is for us to know you. It is your desire, Lord, for us to to, uh, live according to your word. Lord, I pray that something that is said here tonight, Lord Jesus, would allow us, Lord, to leave this place changed with a with a new understanding with a new mindset lord jesus that we can learn something here tonight lord that would allow us to leave here and activate that thing in our lives in jesus name amen everybody say amen amen, amen. so paul commends phoebe our sister so the fact that he calls phoebe our sister is just a, a little note that that uh, the, the, the term brother and sister were in use even in Paul's day when referring to saints of God. We call each other brother and we call each other sister. And that was already in use in Paul's day. Way down in the chapter, you'll find Paul calling out uh, another brother, calling, out a, calling this gentleman a brother. And uh, so that these terms that we use weren't just made up five minutes ago. They go all the way back to the, to the beginning, all right? And then he calls, he calls Phoebe a servant. Now, the Greek word for servant means one who executes the commands of another, especially of a master or a servant or an attendant or a minister, a servant of a king, a deacon, one who by virtue of the office assigned to him by the church Carry, uh, carries, cares for the poor and has charge of and distributes the money collected for their use. So Phoebe is a deaconess in the church. All right? Phoebe is not just, you know, a saint that's sitting in the congregation. Phoebe is someone with authority in the church where she is from. Paul uses this same word, for a servant when he talks about himself. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 7, he says, Wherefore, I was made a minister. It's the same Greek word as the word servant in Romans chapter 16 and verse 1. According to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of power. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25, he says, Wherefore, I am made a minister. It's the same Greek word as the word servant that is used for Phoebe, according to the dispensation of God, which was given to me for you uh, to fulfill the word of God. And in 
And in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, that same Greek word is actually translated deacon. And it says, uh, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in the in the uh, in, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. That word is the same Greek word that Paul calls Phoebe as a servant. So Phoebe is a deaconess in the church. And I said all that to say this. We believe that God can use women as preachers and ministers and evangelists just like God can use men. All right? So we believe that a, a woman can stand up and preach the word of God. All right? Just like a man. All right? So uh, there are some that believe that, that the Bible teaches that women are never supposed to be able to be in a position of authority and can never stand up and preach to men. All right? We don't believe that. We don't believe that. We believe that God can use both men and women according to the authority given to them. Amen? So she is a deacon. He continues talking about her in the next verse. He says that uh, ye receive her in the Lord. He's still talking about Phoebe. That ye receive her in the Lord and as becometh saints, that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. So she's a deacon in the church of Corinth. Now, she is a deacon in, deaconess in the church of Corinth. And it appears that Paul is entrusting her with the delivery of the, of the letter that he's written to Rome to Phoebe to take it to Rome. It appears that's what all the commentaries I read on this said, that Phoebe was the person that Paul entrusted with the letter to the Romans, and he said, here, you take this to them. And he's commending her to them so that she can complete that mission and do whatever else she needs to do while she's in Rome. Okay? So Paul has a lot of faith in Phoebe. Paul has a lot of trust in Phoebe. Paul has put his confidence in her to be able to carry out this mission to, uh, to Rome and take his letter to Rome, it appears. So she's a deaconess in the church. He instructs the church at Rome to receive her and to assist her in whatever business she, she uh, needs to take care of. Now, this word succor means a woman set over others, a female guardian, protectress, patroness, caring for the affairs of others and aiding them with her resources. So it appears that not only is she a deaconess in the church, but she is a woman of some wealth or means. And she has been supporting the church and Paul and others with her, with whatever wealth or whatever uh, means she might have. And that might be why she's able to go to Rome, because she has the money to get from here to there, to get from Corinth to Rome. All right? But uh, so this is just telling us a little bit about this woman, this trusted woman that Paul is entrusting with the letter of, uh, to, to Rome. She's a deaconess, and she has some kind of, it appears that she has some kind of wealth, and she uses that wealth to help others and to help Paul. Now, we might say, wait a minute, why would Paul take money from a woman? Well, took money from women. If you read in the Gospels, it tells us a couple of times that he was supported by, and it lists several women that he was supported by. His ministry was supported by several women, okay? So this is not something that was uh, uncommon, at least to the early Christians. So we continue in verse number four, and it says, Greet, uh, help me out, Penelope, excuse me, number three, Greet Penelope and Priscilla, thank you. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Jesus Christ, who hath for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Now, Priscilla and Aquila are an interesting couple in the Bible. They are, appear to be a husband and wife team. They're married. 
And we first meet Priscilla and Aquila in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. And that's where we meet them. They're introduced, and Priscilla and Aquila are introduced first with Aquila, the man, and then he introduces Priscilla, okay? Now, why am I making such a big deal out of this? We can, we can see who's in charge of something in the Bible by the order of the names. In general, in the Bible, however the order of the names appear, the first person in the order is the one who's in charge. And we can see that when we look at the history of Paul and Barnabas. All right? So I'm going to go through some of that history. We first see Paul and Barnabas together in Acts chapter 11 and verse 30, where it says, which also they did and sent to be and, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas was in charge of that mission because Barnabas is named first. And then in Acts chapter 13 and 2, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work hereunto I have called them, whereunto I have called them. Again, Barnabas is in charge of this mission because he's named first. And then in Acts chapter 13 and verse 7, it says, which was with the duty to the country, and it names this gentleman, Paulus, a uh, uh, prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So once again, Barnabas is still in charge of the mission, whatever the mission was at that point. But by, by Acts chapter 13 and verse 43, something has changed. In Acts 13 and 43, we, we read this. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Now Paul's in charge. Barnabas has taken a, a, a second in command position, and now Paul is the one who is leading the mission. All right? And you'll notice the first three references said Barnabas and Saul. This reference says Paul and Barnabas. So some, somewhere in there, Paul started using, Saul started using his Greek name of Paul. Saul was his, was his Jewish name and Paul was his Greek name. And when he started using that Greek name, when he allowed God to rename him, if you will, that was the time when he took authority and he moved into the position of leadership over the, over the mission. For the rest of the time in the book of Acts that we see Paul and, and, and Barnabas mentioned, there are nine other scriptures where we see Paul and Barnabas mentioned together in the book of Acts in one scripture. In five of those cases, we see it as Paul and Barnabas. In four of those cases, we see it as Barnabas and Paul. So for the rest of the time together, it appears that they shared leadership of those ministries, of those missionary journeys. And of course, we know eventually they separated when Paul took Silas and Barnabas took Mark, and they separated and went their separate ways. But I pointed all that out to say this, uh, uh, <laughs> Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned five times. The couple, Priscilla and Aquila, and they're never mentioned separately. They're always mentioned together, all right? They're mentioned five times, and I had mentioned the first time that they are mentioned is the, when they were introduced, and of course, Aquila is introduced first as the husband, and then they introduce Priscilla. They are mentioned four other times. Two of those times, Aquila is mentioned first. Two of those times, Priscilla is mentioned first. So they were truly a team effort in their ministry to God. They were co-equal. They were co-pastors, uh, 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 if you will, of whatever it is, whatever mission, whatever uh, ministry God wanted for them to do. They were equal partners in that mission because you can tell by the way that God has arranged their names in the scriptures. All right? So... Priscilla and Aquila, Paul says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, 
my helpers in Christ Jesus, who hath for my life laid down their own necks. So this couple did something, and we, it's not recorded in the Word of God as to what they did, but they did something that helped Paul to the point where they risked their own lives to either help Paul or save Paul's life. We don't know exactly what they did, but they did something. And it says, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So Paul says, all the churches of the Gentiles owe this couple thanks for whatever it is that they did. Now, what did they do? It was so important that Paul mentioned it, but it wasn't important enough to get into the Word of God. So we don't know what they did. But they did something that Paul wanted to commend them for because, of, because they saved his life or they helped him in some way. And he says in verse 5, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So this couple had some had church in their house. Now, if you know anything about the New Testament church, all church was in a house. There was no church outside of someone's house. There was no place like this where people got together. They didn't have church buildings. You can't find any place in the Bible where people got together in a church building like this. All churches were in, were in homes, all right? And so this couple, who was leading the church in their home? Well, according to, the verse, to, to verse number uh, three, we can assume at some point it was Priscilla because she's named first. So they are, they are equal partners in their mission. Sometimes she's leading, sometimes he's leading. And that is perfectly fine. There is not a problem with that. All right? Again, we believe that women can be used in, the, in, the, in preaching the gospel and teaching the gospel just as effectively as men. And I think some of these scriptures uh, uh, prove that, allow us to see that. Then we skip down to Romans chapter 16 and verse 13. I told you I was not going to read all those names. So we're going to skip, skip several verses down to verse 13, and it says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. So we believe that Rufus may be the same man who's mentioned in Mark as the son of the man who carried Jesus' cross. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 21, it says, And they compelled one Simon of Cyrene, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. We believe that this Rufus referenced in Romans is the same Rufus that Mark referenced in, in uh, about the son of Simon who bore the cross of Jesus. Why is that important? We don't know much about Simon except that he bore the cross. But some impact must have been had on him because of that. And his son is part of the church some many years later. His son is still in the church. So that's a testimony to what his father witnessed and what happened to, whatever happened to his father uh, while he was carrying that cross. And then in verse 16, it says, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now, I've read this and I thought, and I've thought sometimes, should I actually do that? Should I actually greet somebody with a kiss? You know, what, how, you know, is that, is that a doctrine that I should pick up and try and follow? I don't think Paul was trying to uh, start a new doctrine. I don't think Paul was trying to say this is what we have to do as saints of God, to, to greet one another with a kiss. I think this was more of a cultural thing. Because in the Middle East, and in a lot of parts of the world, that is how people greet each other. You know, we still see it from time to time, uh, where, where two men will, you know, kiss cheeks, one on one side, one on another. 
I've heard there's three different ways you can do it. You can kiss one cheek. You can kiss two cheeks. Or you can kiss three, depending on the culture. And if you do it the wrong way, according to the culture, you're insulting the person. But I think it is a cultural thing, not a, not a, not, that Paul was not trying to set up an ordinance that says that the, that the saints of God have to greet them, greet each other that way. All right? Thank God. Because I am not a touchy-feely kind of guy. My wife is from Mexico. She has a family that is a touchy-feely family. They want to hug you. They want to, you know, my mother-in-law, she was like this all the time. And, you know, she was just, and I'm like, oh, I endured to the end. All right. But I don't think that's what Paul was trying to do. He's not trying to tell us that the churches have to greet each other that way. It's just, it's just the, it was just the custom of the day. It was just the custom of the day. And it was only men to men. It would have never been men to woman. It would only be men to men or woman to woman. Never be man to woman. Okay? So that's verse 16. Verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren... Mark them which cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So here Paul wants the saints in the church of Rome to be aware that there are going to be people that come into their congregations. There are going to be people that come into their uh, uh, churches, into their homes, if you will, because that's where all the churches were. And they were going to cause division an offense. That was their goal. Their goal was to come in and cause division and offense. And Paul says that we were supposed to mark them. We're supposed to identify them and, 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 and pay attention to them. Pay attention in that you're supposed to know who they are that are causing that division. And notice what they're causing division against. You see it? You're causing division against the doctrine. They're causing division against the doctrine. So that doesn't mean that if somebody walks into the church and offends you by saying something that you're offended by, that you mark them as a person that needs to be watched and, and taken care of. Because they offended you. That's not what the offense is against. The offense is against the doctrine. Remember, Paul has spent an entire chapter and a half, chapter 14 and the first half of chapter 15, talking to us about how we're supposed to accept the weaker brother. Right? Remember that? Pastor Overton taught on that. We're supposed to we're supposed to acknowledge that the weaker brother is the weaker brother, and we're supposed to accept them, and we're supposed to encourage them, okay? So if you're offended by something someone does or some, some tradition that they have or some conviction that they have on their own life, that is not what this is talking about. That is your problem to deal with. That is not what this is talking about. This is talking about someone who comes in and starts talking about the doctrine that Paul has taught. What's the doctrine that Paul has taught? Justification by faith. Being baptized in Jesus' name. Being filled with the Holy Ghost. Repentance. Prayer. All the things that we all know and have heard preached and taught. When somebody comes in and starts bad-mouthing those things, those are the people that we should mark. Those are the people that we should stay away from. Those are the people that we should identify as problems. All right? So he says, I beseech you, brethren, mark them that cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Stay away from those who are going to cause division, 
who are going to cause con uh, uh, problems in the congregation. You don't want to associate with them. And he goes on further in verse 18. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. So these are people who are just there with a motive to get their own, to satisfy their own ego. All right? That's what these people are there for. They, I interpret this as they want to take control. These people want to be in control. They want to try and drive a, a nail or a wedge into the congregation and slice some of it off for themselves. Now, we've seen, we've seen people do that in churches. They come in, and they start talking to this one, and they start talking to that one, and they start talking about the pastor, and they start talking about the saints, and they start talking about, well, this doctrine's not exactly right, and they sh you know, show scriptures that seem to prove their point, and they begin to question the, this, and they begin to question that, and pretty soon they've got a little group of, of uh, 5 or 10 or 15, and, and all of a sudden they're just gone. Where'd they go? Where'd they go, Pastor? I don't know. They're just gone. Nobody came and talked to me about it. They're just gone. That's the kind of people Paul is talking about here. So what do you do when you hear that voice? Someone comes to you and says, well, you know, we got a good pastor, but you know, there's this one thing that he pre preaches that I'm not sure about. You know, or there's this one, you know, Brother Vogler, he teaches this stuff, and I'm not quite sure about that, you know. And, and you, hear, you hear that person going to somebody else and saying the same thing, and they begin, to, they begin to just hop from person to person to see if anybody will take the bait, if anybody will listen, if anybody will grab on to what they have to say. And what is your response to that person? Go speak to the pastor. That's exactly right. You need to go talk to the pastor. I had a person, my wife and I were visiting a, a, a person in the hospital. This was many years ago. And this person said to us, I did this, and this person, another person, a third person, said to her that the pastor had done this and done that, and I listened to this, and I thought, that can't possibly be true. I know the pastor. He would never do that. He would never say that. And so we left this woman's room. We got in the car, and the very first thing I did, before I even started the car, is I picked up the phone. I said, Pastor, I just heard this about you. Is this true? And he gave me, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Okay, he gave, me, he gave me the truth, and, you know, I got the truth, and I thought, oh, that makes sense. I understand that, and the, the truth didn't come through the person I had, we had gone to see in the hospital, only, only a skewed version of something that almost happened the way that they said it, but not quite, and the not quite justified the pastor, all right? So, Whenever you hear something like that or when people start questioning the doctrine or when people start questioning the saints in the church, go to the man in authority. Tell him about it. Not to be a tattletale, but he is the protector of the sheep. He is the shepherd. And when a wolf comes in, clothed in sheep clothing, and the sheep begin to be nipped at, what should they do? They should go to the shepherd and let the shepherd deal with it. Let the shepherd deal with it. That's what he's here for. That's what God has commissioned him to do. That's why he's the pastor. So when you get these kind of situations, if you get these kind of situations, go to the pastor. Tell him about it and let him deal with it. And you continue to deal with that person with love. All right? Because 
a lot of times the situation, the pastor will be able to resolve the situation and that brother or sister will be able to remain in the congregation. Other times they cannot resolve that situation and that person will eventually leave. All right? But it's our job to still associate love and minister love to them. Okay? So he says, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. We are to avoid them. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Who are the simple? That's a, that's a good definition. Who are the simple? The ones that don't study the word of God. In this case, the simple are those without guile or fraud, harmless, free from guilt, fearing no evil from others, uh, distrusting no one. All right? So in, in one case, we want to be simple in that we don't want to run around distrusting everybody. But in the other case, we don't want to be simple. We want to be aware of those people who are trying to sow discord, who are trying to sow discontent, who are trying to sow false doctrine, who are trying to, trying to weave their way into a group and, and as if you will, cut that group out and, and consume that group. And we don't want to be that kind of simple that is, a, that is, that is fooled by these, decep by these deceptions. Amen? And then uh, verse number 19 says, For your obedience is come, is come abroad unto all men. So Paul says, the church of Rome, their obedience to the things of God has been noised abroad unto all men. So it's, it's, it's been populated, it's been published around the churches that Rome is an obedient church. And he says, I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So Paul says, I understand that your obedience has been noised around. He says, and I'm glad of that. I'm glad that your obedience has been noised abroad. But he says, I want you to be wise to the things that are good, and I want you to be simple concerning the things that are evil. Now, this is a different word. This word here, simple, is an entirely different word from the previous word, simple. All right? This word means not mixed or mingled. It means be, uh, become because not tainted by sinful motives. It means pure, unmingled, without a mixture of evil, free from guile, Innocent, simple. So Paul says, I want you to be, I want you to be uh, wise in the good things, and I want you to be simple or not deceived by the bad things. Not, not deceived by the things that are evil. He says, I want you to know when you see something that is good, and I want you to know when you see something that is not good. I want you to be able to distinguish between that which is good and that which is not good. And how can you come to the place where you can distinguish from good from bad? How can you come to the place? How can you come to that place? Always put good things into you. Always put good things into you. If you're always putting the good in you, when the bad comes, you'll know it right away. You'll know it right away. There's a very, uh, you know, if you're a bank teller, I don't know if they still do this today, 
but I've heard many times that bank tellers, that this is how they would train bank tellers to be able to handle or to be able to identify counterfeit currency. They let them, they work, they'd work them in school in a, in, with currency, with real currency for a week. And then on the last day, they would slip some bills in that were counterfeit. And by the time they had gotten, been working with real bills for a week, as soon as their hands touched the counterfeit, they knew exactly what it was because they had gotten so accustomed to the feel of the real bill that they, they could identify the counterfeit because it was a different texture, it was a different paper, it was a different whatever. It was different. And just by touching it, they knew exactly that that was not what they had been working with for, for all that time. And that's how we can identify things that are not good. If we constantly put good into us, if we're constantly hearing the Word of God and reading the Word of God and communicating with God in prayer, and we are constantly being led by the Spirit, if we are constantly putting good things into us, then when a, something that's suspicious comes in, we go, wait a minute, something's wrong with that. I, I, I got to question that. Where, do, where is that in the Bible? How do I know that that's the truth? Something feels wrong about that. All right? And that's how we can identify things that are suspicious because we have put so much good, we have allowed so much good to come into us that it's easy for us to say, that is, there's something wrong with that. Think about, think about um, Eve in the garden. If she had just had uh, the ability to discern that what the devil was saying was, 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 was deceptive, was clever, Sounded like, sounded almost good, but just had this just had this bell ringing in her head that something's wrong with this. I need to go talk to Adam before I listen anymore. All right, well, how things would have been different. So we need to have that alarm bell to be able to go off in our head because we have allowed good to come into our life so that when we when we, uh, when we encounter something that is suspicious, we immediately identify it as, wait a minute, I need to question that. Does that make sense? The Amplified Bible says, I would have you well-versed and wise as to what is good and innocent and guileless as to what is evil. The, uh, another translation says, I wish you to be wise indeed as to the good and harmless as to the evil. Verse 20 says, and, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, if you remember way back when, when we started this chapter, when we started this this uh, study on the book of Romans, Paul opened up the book of Romans in verse number 7 with this. To all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and, from, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul gives this impartation of grace and peace at the beginning of the book of Romans. If you remember, I talked about the fact that Paul opened every single letter that he wrote with some version of grace and peace to every church that he wrote to. And so these are not just words of saying, hello, how you doing? This was, a, this was an impartation of Paul to the people of Rome or to the people of Corinth or to the people of Philippi or to the people of Ephesus that grace and peace were available to them. What is grace? Grace is God's empowerment to allow us to do what he wants us to do. What is peace? Peace is that thing that God gives us to let us go through trouble and know that he is still with us. So that is his grace 
and his peace. We have to walk in grace and peace every single day. So Paul opens his letter saying grace and peace unto you, and now he's closing his letter by saying, by saying and, the, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, and grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So he closes his letter with grace and peace, just like he opened his letter. Now, he does use this phrase that, you, that uh, the, the, God, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And this is a reference that goes all the way back to Genesis, the first prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, the first prophecy that God gave us that, 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 there, would be, that there would be enmity between Satan and Jesus Christ or Satan in the church. It goes back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy, of the, of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall, be, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is the very first prophecy that we have concerning what God is going to have victory over Satan. Now, knowing that, knowing that God has given victory over Satan, God is going to have victory over Satan. Listen to what he says. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan. Remember, he says he's going to bruise his head. He's going to bruise Satan. How? Under God's feet. Under Jesus' feet. Is that what it says? Under your feet. Your feet. Under your feet. Not under God's feet. Not under Jesus' feet, under your feet, Church of Rome. You are going to be victorious over Satan. You are going to bruise the head of Satan under your feet. And when Paul says it to the church in Rome, he says it to the church in Laurel because it's the same word of God to Rome as it is to Laurel. Or should I say it's the same word of God to Laurel or to Cross Creek as it is to the church in Rome. So God, the God of peace, is going to bruise Satan under your feet. Under your feet. Under your feet. You are victorious. You are victorious. You are in the body of Christ. You are in the bride of Christ. The body of Christ is victorious over Satan. He has made you more than conquerors. He has made you more than conquerors. He has, he has demonstrated his power. He has demonstrated the victory over our adversary, the devil. We don't have to sit back and, and cower. We are victorious. You are victorious over your adversary. Amen? You are victorious over your adversary. Now, you have to believe it. You won't be victorious if you don't believe it. You have to believe it. But it says that God of the God of peace is going to, to uh, bruise Satan under your feet. Praise God. Thank you, God, for the victory. Thank you, Lord for the victory that you've given us. We don't have to worry about uh, spirits in this area. God will give us victory. God will give us victory. Verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So, who is the one that is 
uh, this, who is the one that is of power to establish you? Who has the power to establish you? Say it. Say it again. Say it like you mean it. Jesus. 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 He is the one that has the power to establish you. And how is that power applied? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? The death, burial, and resurrection. How does that apply to us? It applies through repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and being filled with the Holy Ghost. And that only qualifies you for the race. Now you've got to run the race. Now you've got to live a life that is, that is walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. All right? So it doesn't stop once you come out of the water and you speak in tongues and you say, praise God, I'm, I'm in heaven. Well, unless you die in the water, no, you're not in heaven. You're still here on earth and you got to walk this walk and you got to talk this talk and you got to grow in Christ. You got to mature into the mind of Christ because a baby, when a baby's born, you don't expect that baby to go out and get a job the next day. It takes 18, 20, 25, sometimes 30, sometimes 50 years to get that person to a place where they're mature enough to go out and get a job. All right? So we've got to grow in Christ. We've got to grow in Christ. But this, this verse tells us, that we, that we are established according to the gospel. According to the gospel. And the gospel does not stop when you come out of the baptismal tank. That's only the beginning. There's still stuff we have to learn. All right? And the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. According to the revelation of the mystery. How many here like mysteries? You like to read mysteries? Do you go to the back of the book and read the last page before you read the end of the first chapter? I started reading a book a couple days ago, and the author sets up this sets up this thing about this guy, and I know that she's not going to finish it until the very last page of the last of the book. And I so desperately want to read the last page, but I'm going to read the whole book instead. So we have a mystery. And what is the revelation of the mystery? The mystery that was kept secret. A mystery that was kept secret. Why was it kept secret? Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 6 through 10. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that came to naught. So we are not speaking the wisdom of this world. We're not speaking the wisdom of the kings or the princes of this world. That's the natural rulers and the natural leaders of this world. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now, this mystery is not, the word mystery that's used here is not something that cannot be known. There are some things that cannot be known. This is not one of those things, all right? This is a mystery that is just something that has been hidden and not yet revealed. All right? So it's something that can be known, but up until this point has not been known. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So this mystery has been hidden since God created the earth. He didn't tell anybody. He didn't tell the angels. He didn't tell the Jews in the Old Testament. He didn't tell anybody about this mystery or what this mystery was or how this mystery affected anybody at any time. They didn't know anything about it. All right? Which none of the princes of this world knew. He didn't tell anybody, none of the princes of the world, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had Satan have known the mystery that Paul is talking about, they would have avoided 
crucifying Christ. Because what is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection. It had to happen. The gospel, the death, the burial, and resurrection had to happen. And if God had revealed the mystery to the angels before Jesus' death, he would have revealed it to Satan, and Satan would have made sure that it wouldn't happen. And he would have foiled God's plan. And so God kept this mystery to himself and didn't tell anybody about it at all until after the death, burial, and resurrection. And now the mystery can be revealed. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us. We get to know about the mystery. He didn't tell the angels about the mystery. He didn't tell Abraham about the mystery. He didn't tell Solomon about the mystery. He didn't tell David the apple of his eye about the mystery. He didn't tell anybody about the mystery. But we get to know. We get to know the mystery of God, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We get to know it. For he hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So, so he says, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. What is he doing? He is establishing you. He is establishing you. What does establish mean? It means to make something secure, to make something known, to make something, uh, to, to be able to withstand. He is establishing you so you can withstand according to the gospel, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, in verse number 26 of Romans 16, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets. Look, the prophets and the Old Testament had all the information. It was all there, but nobody could work it out. Not even Satan could work it out. We look back on it and say, how did they miss it? How did they not see it? It's so obvious. But it was in the plan of God that they would not see it. That they would not see it and could not see it until after it had come to pass. That was the plan of God. But now is made manifest this gospel and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And so it is now the mystery has been revealed. The, the, the curtain has been pulled back. Everybody knows the, the uh, availability of the gospel. And, and it's now our responsibility to do what? To preach the word to all nations and give everybody a chance to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that, in fact, was Paul's own mission. That was why God commissioned Paul. God commissioned Paul to be the preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles. And he did exactly that. He, everywhere he went, first he went to the Jews, and when they threw him out, he preached to those that would listen, the Gentiles. And it's our job on earth today to continue that mission. Follow me, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. We're supposed to follow in the mission that Paul did, to preach the gospel. And according to this, it's to, to be made known to all nations. Doesn't that sound like what Jesus said? Amen. To all nations, baptizing them and preaching to all nations, the truth. So we're supposed to preach this thing to all nations. And believe me, in this church, we come pretty close. What, 25 nations last time, right? So we got 25 nations in this church. We come pretty close to teaching and preaching to all nations right here. 
And, and we can, and, and that can grow. We, next time it can be 30 or 40 or 50 nations. That can grow. As this church grows, the nations that are, that are represented in this church will grow. I believe that. I believe that. So that's our commission. That's our commission from God, from Jesus, and from Paul. To teach the gospel, the revelation, and the, and the mystery that had been hidden until Christ. To teach the gospel to all nations and baptize them in Jesus' name and get them filled with the Holy Ghost and, and mentor them and grow them and mature them into, into saints of God that will continue that mission. We are supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. I'm not supposed to seek my own pleasure. I'm not supposed to seek my own, my own comfort. I'm not supposed to seek uh, for my own anything. I'm supposed to seek after the kingdom of God. And when I seek after the kingdom of God, God has, has, has put it upon himself to take care of my needs. If I am truly seeking after his kingdom, he has taken his responsibility as providing for my needs. All right? So let's seek after the kingdom of God. Let's get to a thousand souls and then move on from there. Let's get to a thousand souls and then move on from there. It is possible. It is possible with what we have right now to move to where we want to go, to where God wants to take us. It is more than possible. It is going to happen. It is going to happen. Do you believe it's going to happen? You don't believe very much. You don't believe very much. That was a very tepid response. Do you believe it's going to happen? Do you believe it's going to happen enough to participate? Are you going to participate? Are you going to participate? Are you, are you going to participate? Are you going to participate? Are you going to participate? I want you to think about that. Because there's going to come a time, and it's coming very soon, when you're going to be asked to do some things that you may not have been asked to do before. And if your response is, <laughs> forgive me, Pastor. If your response is, I need to pray about it, I want you to think back to tonight when you said you're willing to participate. If your response is, well, Pastor, you know, I got this going on and I got that going on, I want you to think back to this night when you said you were going to participate. If your response is, uh, I don't think so, Pastor, I don't believe in that, you need to think back to this night when you said you were going to participate. Because it's easy to say, woohoo, I'm going to do it, yes. And then when somebody comes up to you and says, I got a job for you to do, and you go, whoa, wait a minute, I wasn't signed up for that. I didn't sign up for that. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. When you got the Holy Ghost, you signed up for it. All right? Uh, salvation is free. Eternity will cost you everything. Salvation is free. But God wants everything you have. God wants your money. God wants your job. God wants, forgive me, Pastor. God wants, your, God wants your family. God wants your car. God wants your house and your stuff. And God wants you. And he wants you to say, yes, Lord. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Try it with me. Yes, Lord. Try it again. I'm not making you commit to anything. I just wanted you to try it out. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. One more, one more time. Yes, Lord. God wants you to say, yes, Lord. 
He doesn't want you to think about how you're going to do it. Because you're not going to do it. He's going to do it through you. And you need to say, come on, we practiced it. You need to say, that's right. You need to say, yes, Lord. You need to say, yes, Lord. Because he's told us that our job, is to preach the gospel. Oh, Brother Vogler, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a preacher either. I'm not a preacher either. All right? I get up here and I talk. You know? I'm not a preacher. But, in Jesus' name. But, you, you don't have to be a preacher to tell somebody that you love Jesus. You don't have to be a preacher to say, I know a God that can heal your son or your daughter. You don't need to be a preacher to... To, to be able to say, you know, my God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can think or imagine. Let's pray about that. You don't need to be a preacher to do any of that stuff. You don't need to be a preacher to tell the people at your, at your office that, you know, you love God. You don't need to be a preacher. You just need to be, you just need to be someone who hears the voice of God and when God says, go speak to that person, you go and speak to that person. Because God has prepared their heart to hear. We are to go and to teach all nations that they can be obedient to the faith. The last verse, verse number 27. To God, to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Who is the God only wise. Not a trick question. Go ahead. Who is the God only wise? Come on now. You can do it. I know you can do it. Who is the God only wise? This is class participation. Come on. Who is the God only wise? I haven't heard you yet. Come on. Who is the God only wise? Come on now, there's a lot more of you than there are of me, and I can hear myself a lot louder because I got the mic. Who is the God only wise? Tell it to me. Jesus. He is all in all. He is the beginning and the end. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is all wise. Do you know that there is nothing that science knows that God does not already know? You know, we think about DNA. We think about splitting the atom. We think about atomic, uh, you know, the, the atomic forms and all that kind of stuff. And I think, wow. I used to think, wow. I wonder if God knew all that. Yes. Yes, he created it. He created it. There's nothing that God does not know. But knowledge is not the optimum thing. I don't want necessarily knowledge I want wisdom. I want wisdom. And God will give me wisdom. What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is facts. Wisdom is how to use those facts. Wisdom is how to implement those facts. Wisdom is how to encounter those facts and use those facts for the kingdom of God. I want the wisdom of God so that God can impact somebody's life through me. You realize, you realize <clears throat> we don't do it. We don't do it. I can't influence anybody. I don't have the skill. I don't have the ability. I don't have the brain power. I don't have the charisma. I don't have anything that can influence anybody. But when I allow God to speak through me, I don't influence them. God influences them. God speaks to their heart because God knows what they need to hear. God has put them in that position right in front of me so that he can speak through me. And he will speak through you in exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. Let's stand in Jesus' name. That's the end. The last, the final amen.
The final amen in Romans. The final amen. Romans chapter 16 and verse 27. Lord, we pray that tonight, Lord, that something that was said here tonight, Lord, would prick our hearts. Something, Lord Jesus, would get into us, Lord Jesus, that would help us to change our minds, to change our thoughts, to change our attitudes, Lord, to look to you for the answer to every situation, Lord Jesus, to be available for whatever you call us to do, Lord Jesus. Lord, that we would be able to say yes, Lord, when you call upon us, Lord, to advance your kingdom. Lord, I pray that this message would go with us, Lord, that you would work in us, that you would work through us, Lord, that you would do your will and that your kingdom would come into our lives, into our congregation, into our communities. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you in Jesus' name.